Impact Wrestling fan. I'm your host, TW, and this is the Cool Fact. Uh, owner, the bartender, the drink pourer, you know, the uh, the list maker, Mr. BQ. BQ, how you doing, brother? Dude, good, man. Uh, excited to talk about this episode because this was this was good shit. This was, uh, you know, I talk a lot about the shows being, uh, you know, just I don't know so much boring, but just depressing watching. And now we got fans back and everything. So it, it just, it was a totally different experience watching a show. Totally agree. I totally agree. I think that, you know, the thing about this show, right? Normally with impact, we have to lean on the storytelling because they've been doing really good, really strong storytelling for the most part, for the better part of two or three years now. But then when they completely, you know, remove fans and stuff like that, in order to, you know, really try to not let the lack of fans take you out of it, you had to really focus on, you know, they're doing good quality storytelling. You know, they're, right. they're doing this really good. They're doing this really good. Where is this going? Where is that going? Had to really focus in on a lot of those things. Oh, Wrestle House is hilarious. You know, all of this stuff. <laughs> but <clears throat> damn it. The fans came back. The fans came back, and it was great. I do have to say, though, I do have to say, I had one one critique that really just threw me off. I was so excited for this show for the exact reason I just said. I couldn't wait to see and hear the fans back in the Impact Zone for the first time in a long time. And when the show starts, the first thing that happens is... All I'm hearing is D'Lo and Matt Stryker. Now, listen, I like D'Lo and Matt Stryker, okay? I like D'Lo and Matt Stryker. It's one of the best announced combos they've had in a long time. But I've been waiting to hear fans for, what, a year and a half? A long time. And the reason why it's like this, for those of you who don't know, I work in television. I'm a TV producer. So they do the audio for the show in post-production. What does that mean? That means... After they tape the wrestling matches, Matt Stryker and D'Lo Brown go into the studio and watch the watch the show, and they commentate over the show. Now, the way that the audio is mixed, they they just they're they're not able to properly blend the 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 nats right the natural sound of the arena with the 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 the, the commentary track right. So it doesn't sound like they're commentating from in the arena. Um, and again, sometimes like in the middle of a match, it's passable, but when the show starts, all I want to hear is the fans. I want to hear people clapping, cheering, booing. I want to hear the music. That's what I want to hear. You know, like I love when announcers do a great timestamp. We, me and Bika were talking before the, before the show started, you know, one of my favorite announcer timestamps of all time is before the Montreal Screwjob match when Jim Ross goes, it took 18 months to get us here and the smart money says, you'll never see it again. And I'm like, when you look back on it, boom, that's such a fire timestamp he put on that match because knowing what we know now, like that's just, you know what I mean? Like so crazy, right? And he would say that and obviously you wouldn't know that in a moment, but that's why they do what they do. But the difference is if you go back and watch that or any other, you know, live arena show, they're yelling it over hundreds or thousands of people that are in attendance. And it just doesn't sound the same when you're, you know, when your announcers are, you know, trying to fake their excitement because they're, they're, they're watching it in a monitor in an empty room. Right. Yeah. So that was one thing that annoyed me a little bit right off the top of the show, because I was like, yo, bro, I don't want to hear you guys right now. I don't want to. I want to hear the fans. I've been waiting to see and hear fans for a long time, and they're here. And by the way, the crowds came out in full force. Uh, I, I I want to give a, a, a standing ovation. I'm not going to stand up, but pretend <laughs> I'm standing up. I want to give a huge ovation to the people who came out to the Impact Zone, the Skyway Studios, and made these Impact shows lit. <laughs> Slammiversary, y'all were loud and proud, man. Y'all made that show sound great. And even this set of tapings, I could tell y'all were out there. The energy was fire. 
and it just made the show so great. So anybody who was in that show, in that audience, and you hear me, thank you. Keep bringing that energy. Come back every week. Be like the people who go to NXT in Florida every week. Come back every week and cheer and boo and 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 I don't care, damn it. Take over the show. Do your own thing. But I'm just so happy to not have empty arena shows anymore. I know I talked for a long time, BQ, <laughs> but tell me, you know, how are you feeling? Because that's the top story, right? That's the top story is the return of fans to Impact Wrestling. How are you feeling about that? Yeah, I, I want to say, first of all, everything you said was correct, absolutely correct. And and for someone who's done a lot of audio, audio engineering and mixing before, I'm going to assume that there's one microphone in the arena. And mm-hmm. what that happened, what that does, it does is create a monotone, uh, not a monotone, I'm sorry, a mono recording, meaning that everything's just on one track. So when you p- try to place the um, the commentary over it, you pretty much have to lower that volume and compress it down. And that's why a lot of the times in the past, we always say, why can't we hear the crowd? We can sometimes we can't even hear the music. Right. But if you have, you know, um, a microphone on each side of the crowd, you know, each, each of the three corners or whatever that you have them, or you want to do four, whatever. You now have different tracks to work with, and the audio from the recording can just sit right there in the middle, and you can still kind of have that surround sound where you don't have to like bring that audio um, down. Right. So, just having an ear for it, I would imagine it's it's one microphone, and they're just placing the audio on top of it, meaning they have yeah. to bring the the volume down. So, yeah. um, it, it was yeah, a breath. They, they got to do better with that, man, because I think. I think that the, the 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 crowd reaction is what makes people watching at home feel like they want to go be a part of it. You know what I mean? Like, that's why you can tape NXT in, you know, full cell or uh, whatever, like the, the, the full cell arena or whatever. And, you know, they do it in front of, you know, three, 400 people, but you can go to, you know, Bridgeport and sell out 5,000 people. You can go to you know, Brooklyn and sell out 10,000 people. You know what I mean? Because they see that atmosphere of those three, 400 people in full sale going crazy, chanting, and they look at it and they say, that looks like a good time. And that is the number one thing Impact can do to help themselves. You had a building full of people. It doesn't matter if it was two or 300 people. You had a building full of people and you need to you, you should have filmed and packaged as much content from those people as possible because that's your best advertisement is people looking like they're having fun at your shows because that's Impact's number one problem is the their damaged brand name. But if other people are seeing people enjoying it, right? Because right now, a lot of people look at Impact fans as like, ah, those are like people just trying to be different, like trying to be alternative, people who are still fans of WCW or whatever, right? Like they they look at like Impact fans as some sort of subset. Although I know that's not really true because I know more people watch Impact Wrestling. There's little things I talk about all the time that when Impact pops up on like AEW, WWE, you know, people do the delete, 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 or, um, you know, EC3. Everybody knew he was when he popped up in Impact, right? You know what I mean? But nobody watches Impact. Anyway, I'm just saying Impact needs to, mic the fans we need to hear those fans they need to interview the fans we need to see those fans being excited like impact you got people in the building they're excited right now don't waste it it was it was like watching a completely different show and you can see it within the promos within the wrestling itself where uh, i i know this stuff because i well i listen to chris jericho's podcast and he talks a lot about you know how difficult it sometimes can be to sell certain moves to know how long to sell them how to sell them because you don't have the the reaction of the fans Mm. and i guess that's something out of just you know just being ignorant to that kind of stuff i mean i never really picked up on that but now that i I watch the show and i see uh it's different with AEW because they've kind of had some fans for a while so i I don't see it with their product but like with impact where there was just no fans now i see the the wrestlers um you know milking moments a little bit longer or a little bit less if that's appropriate or or the promos like dude the good brothers promos usually i'm like shoot shut up and (laughs) we'll talk about you know their segment but i mean it was so different when they have reactions to work with and they're not having to you know 
try to create their own their own heat like sometimes the crowd is doing it for them um and the crowd tells you something you know like did you hear like the reactions of chris bay it was yes. like you know he's just getting these baby this baby face reaction and and you know now the company can work with that information and be like okay whoa they they really like this dude like yeah instead of trying to say oh we're gonna randomly turn this guy heel baby face because that's what we right. think we should do like now you have some uh, some tangible information to work with and you know to to create your product from so. i will say this though like the crowd was also chanting virtuosa when Deanna Perrazzo came out. And I didn't like that. I did not like that. Deanna Perrazzo is 100% heel in every possible way. And, like, if you like her, boo her. Right. Hey, fans, if you like her, boo her. If you like her, boo her. <laughs> okay? Like, she, that's what a heel wants. They want you to boo them. When Deanna Perrazzo comes out, she doesn't want you chanting virtuosa. She wants you right. losing your mind. Boo! Because that's what she's working, trying to do. All right? Like, you know, like fans get so caught up in like, you know, trying to be smart or whatever. Like, you lose you lose track of just being a fan, right? Being a yeah. fan, enjoying the, the, the show for what it is. And again... People can say what they want. At the end of the day, they want you to cheer the good guys and boo the bad guys. I don't care what they say. The only reason we be talking this shades of gray bull crap is because fans rejected Roman Reigns and John Cena for such a long time. And WWE needed to say something to explain why the fans are, 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 are booing the top baby face. Right. But wrestling is just storytelling and you need protagonist and antagonist okay and that that's for layman's terms that's good guys and bad guys and you know just boo the bad guys i, I that's a sam roberts saying and i hate saying a sam roberts saying but boo the bad guys make wrestling fun okay make wrestling fun let us boo the people we're supposed to boo and cheer the people we're supposed to cheer all right because right, like, because you see yeah. that they're turning Britt baker Babyface, right? Because oh yeah, oh clearly, it's one clearly. of the best heels in wrestling. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And y'all are ruining it. Y'all are <laughs> ruining, ruining it. it. Yes. Like she has worked hard to become a good heel, to become a good hateable heel, and she's good at it too. By the way, she's good at it too. By the way, but because you nerds want to let her know that you like her work you're cheering for her don't cheer her <laughs> she's working to be a a, a bad guy yeah. now here's here's i think a little bit of the the problem is the dmd and i and i 100 i feel a little guilty for this because i don't know if she saw my tweet but i remember oh, God, probably at least over a year ago. I remember uh I remember I tweeted, I tweeted, um, I have to confess when Britt Baker comes out, I love saying DMD along with the uh along with the announcer. But I'm I'm not saying she saw my tweet. I'm not saying that, but she probably saw a bunch of tweets just like that. And um and she and she caught on it. And again, I get it. Like, you know, like, you know, get the fans on your side, whatever. And it, but but you're a good bad guy. Be the bad guy. You have a goon, okay? You 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 put on a dirty glove and stick your hand in people's mouth. You're not a good guy. What are you gonna sell? Little rubber gloves that say DMD? They probably will. They probably fucking do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> like, um, yeah, man. Like, boo the bad guys. Come on, guys. Boo See? the bad guys. Stop getting it up for everybody. And we saw that with Chris <sighs> Bay a little bit, even though I'm saying, okay, well, they're clearly. Well, I mean, the thank God for the that Bullet Club angle. Because it looks like he probably will be going more of a babyface role, but I mean, there was times where he was playing up the audience and okay, give it to you. You know what I mean? Like that's what that's what kills it, dude. And uh, I, I used to always tell this. I'm always telling the story about the last ROH pay per view I watched, and da, da, da. but I remember specifically, and I've I've brought up the story many times too. Donovan Dijak wrestling, dude's a heel in the match. He he does some high high impact move, runs out of the ring, jumps up on the on the railing and starts oh, to the audience like pumping right. him up i'm just like what are you doing 
Right. What are you doing? Yeah. You yeah. know, so no, you're right. Cause even the wrestlers have gotten lost in it, right? Like the wrestlers don't value being a good heel. And I mean, just like, you, you know, okay. Somebody who I have to give their props as much as I hate it. MJF. The Miz. Oh, the you Miz. have to give the Miz his props because the Miz knows he is a good heel and the Miz is a good heel. The Miz had y'all out here cheering for Alex Riley. Remember that? Dude, Remember I liked that? him. I liked him. Though, Miz so. had y'all out here cheering for Alex Riley and Damian Sandow. He had y'all cheering for all of them. Okay. Yeah. You got to give the Miz his credit. Like my big knock on the Miz is the same thing. Like I say with, you know, Alexa Bliss, Adam Cole, the Young Bucks is I just don't see them as like, you know, threatening people. So to in, in my eyes, it's hard to be a bad guy if you're not threatening. Right. right. Uh, but as far as like being a bad, but I'll tell you what. Would I not love the chance to punch the Miz in the face? Woo! Woo! <laughs> like that. But And that means he's done a great job. You know what I mean? Like, he plays that whatever it is about the Miz that gets under your skin, whatever it is, whether it's the suits, whether it's the attitude, whether it's the way he talks, whether it's his teeth, whatever it is, whatever it is about the Miz, like, I guarantee you 80% of the people would like to punch the Miz in the face. But that just means he's great at his job, right? So many wrestlers just want to get the chance. They want to get the cheers. Yeah. They want to get the this is awesome and all of that. And it's like, oh, bro, like just can can can, can we still make wrestling? Can we still make wrestling? You and, know, and, you know, the thing is, a lot of the heels are very snarky and um, they have these great comebacks. And it's more relatable to how people are in real life. Because yeah. the baby faces never have, I was kind of thinking of that listening to Jay White, like he he kind of he was able to be snarky and go back and forth and match them, and the crowd was into that. To where when you got someone like Eddie Edwards, who's just you know I like Eddie, but he just responds with, hey, "Well, if you knock <laughs> me down, I'm gonna get right back up." Like we don't talk <laughs> like that, dude. You know what I mean? Like so, you know, I, I just see that in a lot of a, a lot of promos back and forth with the heel and the baby face. It was it's like the heel in an attempt to be funny is actually being more relatable to the, the people right. in the crowd. So talking how, like how they people do. feel really. Yeah. All right. So let's get into the show. All right. So we see the show getting started and they show us a clip that we got online in the fallout from slam anniversary videos. They posted on, uh, you know, social media where we see Chris Bay coming into his locker room after the ultimate X match and he's like telling Rohit to get out of his room, out of his locker room, out of his seat or whatever. And Rohit gets up and Chris Bay walks in and he sees a, a, a shirt laying on the chair, tosses the shirt back to Rohit. Rohit's like, it's not my shirt. Rohit tosses it back to Chris Bay. Chris Bay opens it up. Camera comes around to see the shirt and it's a Bullet Club shirt. Cliffhanger. All right, cool. So the first match we get is Chris Bay against Rohit Raju with Shira. All right. Nice match. Again, it was so <laughs> awesome to hear the crowd during this match. Chris Bay ended up getting the win with the Art of Finesse, which is a, you know, a springboard cutter. Great move. Chris Bay gets the win. Um, Chris Bay is coming back through the curtain. And backstage, we see him talking to Jay White. Jay White basically meets Chris Bay as he's coming back through the curtain backstage, and they start playing uh, BQ's favorite song underneath the, the conversation. So loud. And so uh, loud, Jay White, the leader of the Bullet Club, basically asks Chris Bay, hey, did you get my message? Referring to the Bullet Club t-shirt that he left in Chris Bay's locker room. Chris Bay tells him that he walks alone, and Jay White tells him that this offer will expire and it won't be around forever. Uh, BQ, what'd you think of this segment? So first with the with the segment that they put out there, that was, you know, I, I've criticized their their social media marketing since, I mean, forever now, right? And um, putting that out there on Twitter was was absolutely genius. That's the kind of shit they need to do. And I've been thinking about this for a while. So they like to kick off their shows with this is what happened last week and, you know, play these uh clips which i think they run a, a little too long but then i'm watching television sometimes and you know they'll 
sometimes you'll be watching a show, uh, you know, maybe an, an episodic show, and it'll be like last week on something. But a lot of the times they also give you previews of what's going to happen later in the show instead. Um, instead of talking about what happened before, they're giving you a preview of what's going to happen later. And, it, you know, and that's a strategy, obviously, to, to let people know what to expect and to watch. And I always wonder, like, man, I wonder if that's a better strategy for Impact. You know, because they waste a lot. The show opening wastes a lot of time, in my opinion. Um, and I feel like they could do better with teasing like, hey, here's some of the stuff that's going to happen. Granted, they're trying to pretend they're live, so maybe they can't pull that off. But uh, putting this out there as like a teaser on on social media was awesome. That was great. Like, I really think they need to do more of that. Uh, um, you know, film backstage segments that, that didn't really happen at the last week show or yeah. the pay-per-view or whatever and, and, and put it out. I mean, that's that's really the way they did it. Um, and then this whole, they really, I thought they were going to let weeks pass and they're going to still, I wonder who's going to join the Bullet Club. Because we knew like, you know, the it came out that someone was joining from Impact and they, yeah. they really got to it very quickly, which I thought was the way to handle these tapings. Don't, you know, well, there's so many spoilers out there. Don't drag mystery angles too much. Yes. Um, you know, I'm glad they just got to it so they can start telling that story. And, you know, the match is what it was. Fulton and Shura at Slammiversary, I thought, looked like fools. Mm -hmm. So there was no, you know, I, I think they really damaged the both of them at Slammiversary getting squashed. Uh, so there was no doubt in my mind that these two guys were going to lose and that Fulton would take the pin. And that's what ultimately happen match is what it was i i've never i don't really care for all, fulton and ace as a tag team just because why should i they don't beat anybody so um and i'm not a huge fin juice guy i know yeah. some people like him i don't really care for them but um it was cool it's, it's what it was but it but it was just nice to hear you jump you know. all the way ahead to fin juice we still we still on row heat versus uh chris Benton. oh my god i'm sorry dude i got i got the <laughs> i got him confused because i was thinking of the slam anniversary match that uh, uh that, that Rohit that and Shira, I, I really scarred you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It was Ro so is Rohit and Shira versus Finn Juice, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's I, like, I that's just, like, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, I got them all no, confused. No, get Finn Juice off the brain. It was Rohit with Shira against Chris Bay. Oh my god, dude. Yes, that was the opener for the show. We're recording late here, so <laughs> I don't know why I thought. <laughs> Even though <laughs> I went on such a tangent about that other stuff, I completely got everything confused. So, no, I'm sorry. Uh, that's why I was like, this is just a match. It was fine because I didn't remember it. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, the uh, yeah, the opener between those two was awesome. I f my first my first thinking was, haven't we seen this match like 50 times? And yeah. I actually don't know that we have because they just – they they talk a lot backstage, but I, I don't know if they had ever wrestled. Um, I think I think maybe they had once before, but um, it was good. Rohit's like stepping up so much as a performer; it's crazy. He really has. I mean, my God, you know. But, and you know um, what's so funny? Sorry to cut you off, but you know what's so funny is I remember, man. If we were to rewind the tape, probably about a year and a half ago, you and I had this conversation where I was saying, you know, why in the hell do they expect us to care about? uh the the desi hit squad now you know after they've just been you know losers for so long you know why are they expect us to care about them now and then i think the next week out and then you you know you talked to me a little bit about you know what you know about you know rohit and i was like all right let me let me just you know let me keep an eye on it and then it just you know his individual performances started to just stand out a lot more to me and then i i remember i was saying how oh, man you know, it's actually kind of easy to heat somebody up. You just got to have them, you know, have them win a little bit. And you just start taking them more serious. And ever since then, I swear, man, I've just been seeing more and more of the growth and progression of him. Watching Ethan Page's blogs, you know, I would see Rohit at the gym working out with him. And you can see it in his physique. Like, yeah. you can see that, you know, he's he's in probably the best shape he's ever been. And um all of it just makes, again, maybe that's me being like a smart fan, but I just, I have so much respect for the work he's doing, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, I, I respect the fact that he's being a dope bad guy and I just respect what he's doing, especially considering the fact that he was saddled with an anchor of a gimmick for a very long time. 
And to, to be able to, you know, kind of rise above that and really establish yourself as a mainstay in the company right now, I think, like, this guy is really just doing a phenomenal job. So I just wanted to give Rohit his flowers real quick because he's definitely been doing his thing. Hell yeah, dude. Um, I know from talking to him, you know, personally that he's always – Ask Impact to continue to challenge him. Like, what, what do I, what do you need from me to show you I can, you know, I can be one of the people around here. So he's he's doing awesome. And then this was this was really good for Bay. And it was, it's funny when they were doing the whole what side is Bay on? Like they were kind of yeah. like he was bouncing back and forth between babyface and and heel type of shit. Like I don't want to say it was to throw us off a scent because no one know, knew what to come. But I mean. Clearly, there was some kind of story they were telling with that. I, I don't quite understand what they were trying to do in in relation to how it ties into the Bullet Club stuff. But, you know, he was he was just as I said when we were reviewing the show, he was the basically the last two, you could say, so to speak, in the Ultimate X match when I, right. when him and Josh were one of them was going to win and grab the title. Right. Um, so that lets you know they had some plans for Bay. So, you know, they've, yeah. they've been laying some stuff out for him and. Yeah, no, that's a great point. When in the lead up to the match, I was getting a little worried because, you know, we'll talk more about this later. But, you know, if you listen to the show, you know, I have a grand plan for Josh Alexander and uh, we'll talk more about that later. But <clears throat> when I saw them making Chris Bay the focus of the story leading up to the Ultimate X match, it made me a little worried about, you know, because the, listen, the plan for Josh Alexander is very specific. and you know, you can probably deviate from it a tiny little bit, but I really think there's one way that this needs to be done. And if Chris Bay was going to win the Ultimate X match, then I thought that would have really derailed the plan for Josh Alexander. So I was a little worried, but now, just like you said, it makes sense, right? Why was Chris Bay the focus of the Ultimate X, of the story going into the Ultimate X match? Because you're establishing that Chris Bay is a lone wolf. So the idea of him being presented with, you know, um, membership into this prestigious club, right? Like we, we have a, a precedent for this. And you're also, again, just by featuring somebody, just, it, it's so easy to heat somebody up. Just make them the focal point of the story. So, yes, yeah. good stuff right there. All right. Bless. Backstage, we get Don Callis being interviewed by Mean Gia. <laughs> and Don Callis is talking about, you know, how uh, how concerned he is for Kenny Omega's well-being after his no DQ match with uh, with Sammy Callahan at Slammiversary. Excellent match, by the way. It would have got my, my match of the weekend if it wasn't for uh, Sunday night, which, you know, whew. They just blew that shit out of the park. But, <clears throat> but uh, so Don Callis basically also says he's happy to see Jay White is here. Um, but as long as, you know, he and Kenny Omega have the Impact World title, they have all the power in Impact Wrestling. All right. Then we go back out to the ring and Mickey James returns to the Impact Zone and she invites Deanna Perrazzo back to the ring. She basically wants to make it right after she uh, kicked the piss out of Deanna Perrazzo on Sunday, uh, on Saturday, after her match against Thunder Rosa. And Deanna Perrazzo comes out. Uh, Mickey James tells her that she wants Deanna to appear at NWA Power. M M Power. And uh, Deanna tells her that the only way she'll appear is if Mickey apologizes, if she gets down on her knees and grovels. So then Gail Kim comes out to the ring and she just de-escalates the tension and Gail comes out and she praises both of them. And then we get a handshake from Mickey and Deanna. So does that mean that they've basically agreed to do the match at the pay-per-view? What do you think? Sounds like it. Um, I got to say Mickey James, first of all, looks freaking phenomenal. She um, she really did a slam reversary too. I was like, "Good lord, girl!" Um, hmm. and it, Gail does and always, always has, probably always will. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of popped when watching it, like clapping to myself. I mean, I actually did clap because you know I'm going to N NWA in power because it's in St. Louis, uh, so I'm like super excited about it. And they have announced two names for it so far, and they're. I don't want to disrespect people in the industry. They're essentially two nobodies. Okay. Um, 
And the first, <laughs> they announced the first one, and they're like, St. Louis is on, da da da. And I was like, yo, I live out here. I go to a lot of wrestling in St. Louis. You know, I, I left some com- a comment on N- NWA's Facebook. It's like, I have no idea who that is. Right. You know, and, and, and no one did in the comments. And one guy was like, well, if you, you must not really go to wrestling out there because she wrestles every weekend. I'm like, well, I guess I haven't been to the bingo halls yet. I'll, I'll, right. you know, I'll work on that one. <laughs> so, uh, so I was excited because it gave me a name to really look forward to. And it was some re- representing impact, but I enjoyed this segment a lot. And this is what I, what I was saying about the fans, you know, helping the wrestlers in the ring feed into the, you know, know where, where to create the drama and to how to leave the pauses and to, to, yeah. I mean, I just, I enjoy the shit out of it. Um, when Mickey James music hit though, and when Gail Kim's music hit and, uh, there was someone else later, uh, someone else in the show when the music hit, I was like waiting for that, like crowd pop that reaction. And there was just none because of what we were talking about, bringing the damn volume down. Right. Um, so I, that was kind of, I, I wanted more from that, uh, watching that in TV, but I mean, I just enjoyed it a lot what they did. Like you said, just those big drops in the audio, just really, you know, it's like, ah, ah, you're taking me out of the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, all right. We saw the promo of Long Live the Drama King. You got any clues or thoughts or ideas on who this is? I mean, I I, I know that it's, um, you know, artists formerly known as Aiden English. I'm not familiar with the gimmick, but I guess it's some kind of theater gimmick that he does um i enjoyed what he did in nxt with the vaude villains i i always found that funny without them trying to be funny necessarily like i thought the gimmick was so original i always enjoyed that so i guess he his indie you're like raising your eyes like okay but <laughs> I, I just i enjoyed you lost it me at eight in english <laughs> <laughs> did you not know it was him no i didn't know it was him oh really yeah yeah it's him yeah He's drama, the drama king Matt is like his Twitter. The, the reason I know is because on Slammiversary, I Googled drama king wrestler and he, okay. he came up and that's okay. his Twitter handle. So I was like, ah, okay. Ah. But I guess, and it fits now because uh, Mike, who does the Impact Republic podcast with me, was saying that he's, it's like a theater gimmick that he does, which would make oh. s- sense knowing the vaudeville and stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! That's I don't. All I, I don't say. know if it's good Yikes. or or not. I have no idea. This uh, has a uh, wrestle house written all over it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, good luck. Get 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 you a check, brother. Um. <laughs> all right. After making her shocking impact return at Slam Anniversary, Chelsea Green is back in action tonight. We got Brian Myers, Tanil Dashwood, and Sam Bill. Uh. With Caleb with a K <laughs> versus <laughs> Matt Cardona, Chelsea Green, and Jake something. Uh, Jake something continues to be toiling in uh, nothingness. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but we we did get to see Taylor Wilde return in this match. And I thought that was just so weird, but out of okay. nowhere. Yeah. And um, no pop. That was the one I was thinking of. No, nothing. Mm. And I don't know if it was just the audio, the audio levels, nothing. Right, not, right, right. Crickets. Uh, the match ended when Chelsea Green hit Sam Bill with the unprettier for the win. <sighs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, listen, I'm happy to see Chelsea Green back. And I do have to say this. I do have to say this. Excuse me. I think I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. I heard an interview with Chelsea Green uh, done by those wrestling girls. You guys, you know, look it up on YouTube. And I really enjoyed it, man, because it really humanized her for me. Um, you know, if you, if if all you're used to seeing is somebody po- posting bikini pictures, then you're going to assume that that's what they want you to see them as, right? Like, look at my body. Look how I look in a bikini, you know? If all I post is, you know, videos and pictures of me working out, you're going to think that's that's what I want you to see me as. Look at my body or uh, let me sell you some workout plans, that type of shit, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> so, but so so I found myself um, being super guilty of like you know looking at Chelsea Green and thinking like yo. Why are you always posting all these body pics? Like, you know, do you think you're hot stuff? And just kind of, you know, like looking at her that way. And some of the things that she talked about in that interview, I definitely found myself thinking, you know, like about her or whatever. And it, you know, made me feel like a jerk because it's because again, you forget that this person's a human. You're just, you know, you're mentally interacting with what you see them present, you know, on like a social media standpoint. And, um, and anyway, it's like I said, it was a great interview. It really humanized her. And honestly, I feel like I just can't not root for her now because she seems like a really cool person. Um, that said, you know, she's also, <laughs> she's a pretty good wrestler too. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's fun in the ring. You know, she's really good at performing. I think, you know, getting a chance to go do WWE and do Lucha Underground and do all the other things that she's done. She really has a good mastery of just performing as a wrestler. Yeah. And you can see that, right? Like you can see that, you know, Impact used to be a really good incubator for people to go to WWE and be TV ready, right? When that's why AJ Styles never had to go to NXT. Bobby Roode went to NXT, but he didn't have to. You know what I mean? Samoa Joe, like all of these guys, because they were in TNA working in front of crowds all over the world, like they knew how to wrestle on TV. Um, and now, right, it's almost like the company has gone in reverse and they're pulling people from the indies working in front of nobody. So, you know what I mean? So they're not getting that training. But because, you know, WWE went through its phase where they were just hoarding talent for the sake of hoarding talent, now they're purging themselves with some of that talent. And so you're getting people back out into the indies slash smaller promotion world and they have the training of performing on a big stage right and you see that with somebody like chelsea green you know what i mean like again her wrestling very crisp you know what i mean very crisp her performance all the stuff she does like not a whole lot of wasted motion and it's really it's it's, it's really refreshing to see and um where i was going with this was if you look just just like that you know the knockouts division now has chelsea green you know, you bring back Taylor Wilde, um, you know, you just dipped in Thunder Rosa, you're dipping in Mickey James, and all of a sudden, Tasha Seals about to be a single now. Um, all of a sudden, you know, it's a lot more refreshed. So, you know, it it's good, it's, it's, it's good times, good times for impact. I liked um I liked her fluorescent green ring gear because a lot of the a lot of the impact wrestlers were they were a lot of black. Mm -hmm. it were a lot of dark blues dark reds um and i know i made the comment at rebellion i I couldn't even see willie mac in the ring because his trunks were the same exact color as all that red that they have oh. and then there's you know the dark background i was like dude i could even hardly like see him right. um, but they all wear such subdued colors that just seeing that brightness was just i enjoyed watching it because it just she popped out at the screen for me. Um, but yeah, she is crisp. She's good. I wish she still kind of had the hot gip, the hot mess makeup that like a anniversary. So I don't know if maybe she's just not going to do that at all. Uh, I like the way she had it without, without, you know, getting too crazy, but you know, when she hit that, the unprettier, it made me think of something. And I honestly, I've been, I've been thinking about this for a while. I think impact has to do a better job branding the, finishers because mm. off too often they're oh you know the the pedigree the you know they're right. they're they're use, code breaker you know they're using uh titles that other wrestlers gave them and they're not the real right. names of the hold you know what i mean they're giving them the yeah. wwe title versions um and for us to buy into wrestlers sometimes and enjoy sometimes you you get into the they got a cool title for their their finisher or something like that you know what i mean sure. and it's like jake something does his move like the black hole slam like okay that's abyss's move dude like you're does jake something right. really call it the black hole slam yeah um you know so well Bret I, Hart I, got away for years doing the scorpion death lock and nobody said anything to him no 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 i, I don't mean the actual moves themselves but the names of the moves like 
I was like he joking. branded it the sharpshooter. I, I know that was the joke. That was oh. the joke. Oh, Come okay. On. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, right over the head. Right over the head. But yeah, but that's actually a good example because he branded it the sharpshooter and and right. made it his own. Um, and then people were waiting for the sharpshooter. If it was the Scorpion Deathlock or the rever- you know, Rugged Ronnie Garvin used to do very similar finish, or he called it the reverse figure four. Like, uh. who the fuck? You, you know, like, here comes the reverse. It's not like that. Right. Like, sometimes you just got to have a cool finisher name like Deanna Perrazzo has for hers and stuff. But when you sit here and just, oh, it's it's the Black Hole Slam, then you got Josh Matthews, right. you know, making up Cross Rain, you know which I promised that wasn't the name of the move. Um, <laughs> Cause I was just, because they took that from crossroads from Cody. Right. It's just like, dude, it, it's kind of like when Rosemary had the red wedding, you know what I mean? Now she doesn't mm-hmm. really do that. She does other stuff, but it's just what's, yeah. what's Rosemary's finisher. You, you, you know what I mean? Who the fuck even knows right now? The spear, the, she does some other sit down ass buster move. Like, <laughs> So I just yes, think, Buster. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> I just think, you know, just like Eddie has the Boston knee party, that's a great name right. for his move. Like I just think they have to yeah. brand the, the the some of the moves and the finishers to make mm-hmm. it feel very um like they belong to the wrestler, like they belong to the show. Right. You know what I mean? When exactly. again, you're exactly. grabbing WWE yeah. titles, like it it just, you know, be creative here. But uh I, I'm confused though. So she was allowed to pin Sam Beal. Yeah, which I thought was fine because, you know, Impact certainly has been out front with the uh, with the intergender wrestling, you know? Yeah. So to me, I feel like if you're Impact, it'd be wild hypocritical of you to be with the only men can fight men, only women can fight women. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, hypocritical true. is not even a word. Like, that'd just be like completely deviating from the fact that you just had a woman world champion, you know, what, 18 months ago? Yeah. So, I love that know. Sam Beal had the uh the notebook in the ring, like brought it to the ring. <laughs> uh and it got me thinking in the head, dude. I would laugh so hard if he if he tossed that the notebook to Brian Myers during a match one time, like for a foreign object, and then he just, you know, runs him, hits a dude with the notebook and the guy has no doesn't sell it at all, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that shit would be funny, but um Oh my god, not yeah. the loose leaf. <laughs> yeah, I know. So um <laughs> that man has a family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh after W. Morrissey used a steel chair to help defeat him, Eddie Edwards, uh, excuse me, help defeat Eddie Edwards ahead at Slammiversary. Eddie wanted to take things outside. So Morrissey meets him in the parking lot and a brawl breaks out near the production trucks. Uh Eddie beat him down with some kendo sticks. And he made Morrissey run away. What'd you think about this little parking lot brawl? You know, I, th- I thought it was cool. It reminded me the Tessa Blanchard, Sammy Callahan one, you know, a year or so oh. ago. That, that was was pretty good. So uh, this brawl was actually initially recorded in conjunction with their actual match that they're having next week. I think oh, they're really? fighting next okay. week. It was it wasn't part of the match, but it was like after the match. That's why Morrissey came out without a shirt, and there was fans outside. Because Eddie had said to all the fans, like, we're taking this outside. Follow follow me. You know, like. Yeah, I noticed there was, like, fans out there. But I was like, mm, it feels a little weird, but okay. Yeah, it made sense with Tessa Blanchard and Sammy because it was the very end of the show. Right. But with this, this wasn't the end of the show. So, all of a right. sudden, there's just clearly fans out there, not bystanders. Yeah. So, um, I, I just thought that was that was weird, but. Yeah, so initially Eddie was like, "Hey, follow me outside," which I thought would have been good television if he if he really did do that to the fans and then went outside, yeah. um, you know. And maybe that's just what they did for the actual arena. But if that would have translated on television, I think that actually would have been kind of cool. That would have been something different, like to do the wrestler who got the fans to follow him outside. Right. Uh, I thought that would have been awesome, but um, it it, it was cool. Um, I was thinking when Eddie was cutting this promo, it's it's like. I always desire so much more from him talking. Um, and he also, look, dude, I love Eddie Edwards. Like, I think his look is ridiculous, man. Like, it's it's getting a little hard to take him seriously as like the main eventer with the freaking braids and all that shit. Like, mm. yeah, I'm, I mean, it's not the I, hair. It's I'm the, not it's into the it. Super fat. That's what it is. 
I mean, like, I think if he if he had his hair the exact same way, but he still looked like a cruiserweight, you know what I mean? Like, you'd be fine with it, you know what I mean? But the hair is just like um, the 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 hair expression of everything that's also happening below the neck. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, he's letting it go, doesn't care up here. He's letting it go, doesn't care down here. And it, it is what it is. Uh, all right. Following their loss, Tanil Dashwood tells Brian Myers that she won't be teaming with him at Impact Homecoming in the tournament. It's going to be, a, a, I guess, an intergender, an intergender tournament streaming July 31st, exclusively on Impact Plus. And Sam Bill gets blamed for costing Brian Myers his partner for the tournament. Sam says he's sure he can find Brian Myers a new partner. All right. Jay White comes to the ring to explain why he came to Impact Wrestling. White you know, I want to see an impact for one person, his New Japan resurgence opponent, David Finley. White accuses Finley of coming to Impact so that he could hide from him. White turns his attention to the Good Brothers and he says, I, I, Hold on, I, let me just let me back up here. I love the line that he used to transition from talking about David Finley to talking about the Good Brothers. He said, I'm here for the biggest bullet club fans in the world. And the fans are like, ah! And he's like, no, not you. I'm here for the Good Brothers and Kenny Omega. And I was like, dog. Yeah. Oh, that was nice. Um, so he basically goes on to berate these guys. And then eventually we get, uh, we get those guys to come out. We get uh, Don Callis, Kenny Omega, and the Good Brothers. They all come out. And Don Callis basically refers to the elite, uh, you know, as a super faction. And he tells Jay White that he should ask for permission to join them. And then Omega uh, and and Callis allow the Good Brothers to walk down to the ring and kind of take care of Jay White. They come in there to jump him, and that's when Chris Bay comes in to even the odds. They beat up the Good Brothers. Good Brothers run off. All right. A lot to unpack here. Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot to unpack here. I'm going to let you go first before I give my thoughts on this. So I was engaged with this segment from just about top to bottom. Like the beginning when he was kind of J.Y. started talking for, the, say, like the first three minutes. I'm like, what is he talking about? Um, it sounds like he's just trying to hype up a New Japan pay-per-view without tying it into anything having to do with Impact. That, that's that's what I thought he was doing at first. So I was like, okay, whatever. Which would and be then, typical for Impact. Right, right. Uh, but then, you know, it started progressing and everyone was... I mean, dude, by the time it was over, I was like, this was great. This They really hyped up the possibilities. Like... When they announced, oh, they're partnering with AEW, like the, we started thinking the possibilities of what could happen, and then nothing happened. And with this, now all of a sudden, th there's possi possibilities that look like they're actually going to play out. Right. Um, you know, people were, I remember how hyped people were when they did LAX versus the old LAX, you know? Right. Versus the OGs who were essentially jobbers. They didn't beat LAX one single time, but still the idea of the feud uh, was you know, to use an impact term, a, a dream match. And right. that's what they're, you know, looking like they're going to be able to the world. Right. Uh, dude. Uh, D'Lo is constant. Like oh, the whole world. I'm like, yeah, the whole world, dude. Um, uh, you, you know, that being said, dude, I, I just enjoyed it. Um, Jay, I, I was really appreciating Jay White's promo style by the end of this thing. Yeah. I, I haven't seen anyone, you know, command the audience in that way. And I know this sounds goofy, but honestly, since like the first Aaron Rex promo, uh, when, when he, when he first came out before he like, you know, he fell off a cliff real fast, but that first promo he cut dude was just scathing, man. And, and I mean, he was really playing as the audience. And ever since then, every other, every promo during impact, I'm just like, Oh my God, it's fucking sucks. You know? Not sucks, but it just just bored me, and I just I haven't seen someone command the audience like that in so long. And and um, the Good Brothers, who I find annoying with everything they they freaking do, like 
I didn't this time around. I was, I was, I was just feeling it. I was, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't like, get those guys off my screen. You know, Kenny Omega actually came out, you know, when the music played, I was like, okay, here comes Don Callis. I'm like, dude, Kenny Omega's out. Like, I couldn't believe he actually came out and it wasn't like, cause they film a lot of segments with, with me and Gia, Gia and, um, Don Callis to where they're outside the locker room, which we know right. Kenny's not even there half the time, but mm. you know, they, they play like that. I couldn't believe he actually came out. Um, you know, selling selling the slam anniversary had the had the bandage and everything. So, you know, um good attention to detail. But this was so cool and it just just opened up uh so many possibilities. And I just hope they don't uh you know just blow their load on this stuff too fast, which they kind of are because next week, oh next week good brothers versus you know but whatever. Listen, sometimes um, if you're really enjoying yourself, you blow your load fast. And it yeah. happens. It happens. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. <laughs> <laughs> true, Enjoy true. it while it lasts. Yeah. <laughs> um, can't help yourself right. sometimes. I got it. <laughs> Think about baseball. Think about yeah, baseball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right. All right. So uh, back to the show. So much to unpack here. All right. And <clears throat> Let me start with this. You guys know, if you've been listening to the show, or anything I have to say, what do I always say about the Good Brothers? They got the Good Brothers here riding off their reputation in New Japan and ROH. Well, I don't watch New Japan, and I don't watch ROH. So you got to impress me now, okay? Like, you got to impress me with your work right here, right now, today. So when I see the Good Brothers being treated like they're so funny and such big, big stars. I'm like, yo, a lot of this is, I'm not even going to say it's going over my head because to say it's going over my head would be to suggest that it's funny on a level that I just don't get. And that's not true. It's just not funny, right? So a lot of people, again, like you're just, you're fans of them from where you saw them before and they did something really good and that's fine. But don't try to tell me that they're good now just because you like them from before. And that's a lot of what I get with the Good Brothers. So I said that just to say I knew of Jay White, right? Like I I, I, I knew of him just because, you know, I'm on these internets. And so I, you know, I've, I've heard of him. I, I knew, you know, that he's a New Japan person and, you know, popular, whatever, right? A lot of people talk big talk about him, but I never seen him because he's never been on no show that I watch. Right. Okay. So I came into this with no real knowledge or impression one way or the other about Jay White. Jay White owned this segment. Jay White is a top guy. I got no hesitation in saying that because what he did right here in this segment, he commanded the crowd. He told us a backstory, right? Got us invested. He sold a match. He sold his upcoming match. Got us invested in the backstory of the Bullet Club. By the way, if you're someone like me who knew of the Bullet Club and thought it was kind of cool, but I'm not going to lie. I really got turned off by the, by the Bullet Club when it became intertwined with the Young Bucks. The Young Bucks, to me, just were a huge turnoff because – their whole thing is just like playing wrestler. And it's just like, again, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I can't, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's just not like the young bucks are like two dudes who you knew who sat in the back of the class and you knew they were total jack offs and they have a backyard wrestling show and it picked up and they got famous. And you're like, yo, congratulations on your success. Like, I still think you're a dork, but congratulations <laughs> on your success. Right. And so like, that's, that's, that's kind of what I see when I see the young bucks. And so when the Bullet Club kind of became synonymous with them, I was like, eh, yeah, you know. Um, but prior to that, there was this really cool, interesting legacy of the Bullet Club, right? It was this thing that was out there, and I would see a little bit of it. And then when AJ Styles went to New Japan 
And he became the leader of the Bullet Club. I'm like, oh, what is this? I really want to see, right? And then there was the tie-ins with the AJ Styles and Prince Devitt and, you know, all of that stuff. And then AJ left. And the rumors of AJ and the Good Brothers were coming, coming back to Impact, but it ended up in WWE. And then it was like... Then it was like the Bullet Club needed a, like remodeling, right? And I think that's when he ended up with uh, who who came after that. It was that oh, that was when the ROH guys started taking over, right? That was when it was like um, uh, the Umbrella guy and the um, and the Young <laughs> Bucks. Was Adam it? Cole? Adam Cole yes. was in it for a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So again. So at that point, I'm like, eh. yeah. This went from being like something that was like cool to all the guys who look like they're playing wrestler, and I'm like, I'm good, right? Right. But I think there's a there's a and and then they always had like the Tamatangas, right? The people who were like again, like the OGs of it, right? The OGs mm-hmm. of it, like the people who are still like they kick your ass, like you know for real. Um, and those are like those are like the tough guys who protect. The, the 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 dork who likes to hang out with the cool guys you know what i mean like so um so so it always had there was like a feel there was like a flow to it but the thing that made it so popular also made it uncool to me so there was these two like kind of almost generations of the bullet club right and gallows and anderson are part of that AJ Styles OG Bullet Club thing. And whatever the Bullet Club is now is so far from whatever that was that there has to be some sort of story about like, you know, is there like Bullet Club alumni? Is it like once you're in, you're always in? You know, could they go back at any time and still be cool? Like, what's the deal, right? And this is the story that Jay White told us all at once in this promo. He was like, in case you were wondering, I see you guys out here still throwing up up too sweet. That's old hat. We don't do that no more. It's my day. And y'all ain't welcome no more, just in case you were wondering. And I'm like, boom, perfect. Gauntlet laid down. You also, and by the way, that established another level of cool for the Bullet Club for me because I'm like, again, you got the guys who were the OGs but became looped in with the guys playing wrestler and, you know, all the too sweet, too sweet, too sweet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so corny to me because the NWO never really even did that like that. Um, yeah, I think it's gay. And so, again, so Jay White did all of this. Then Kenny Omega came out. And this is what's really key. You get Kenny Omega and Don Callis and the Good Brothers come out and they're all treating this guy with respect. They're treating him like a real threat. So instantly, and I'm telling you from the perspective of somebody who had minimal previous knowledge or impression of Jay White, they made this guy to a new audience, me, in one segment. And immediately i want to see more about this guy i want to see more about it then you had chris bay come out to make the save and it appears as though chris bay is going to be leaning bullet club i still don't know you know i still don't know like chris bay he's the ultimate finesser you know he could be (laughs) pulling a swerve here but there's a whole nother conversation to be had about if chris bay does join the bullet club yo i'm worried I'm worried that Impact is wasting Chris Bay. I'm worried that Impact is wasting Chris Bay because I think, I think that Chris Bay is their next AJ Styles. I think he's right, you know, we say it all the time, right? Like, they're more worried about telling you that AJ Styles used to wrestle there than they are about finding the next AJ Styles. Mm -hmm. And I think Chris Bay is their next AJ Styles. But they're not necessarily treating him like it. They're not putting him in like feature positions. They're not marketing him. They're not pushing him. You know, that he's just kind of doing stuff. And I'm like, y'all need to pay attention. Y'all need to pay attention. There are very few people that wrestle in Impact that people talk about outside of Impact. And Chris Bay is one of those people. And if Chris Bay is about to go be in the Bullet Club, guess what? 
he's going to bring eyes to the bullet club that wasn't thinking about the bullet club. Mm -hmm. So he's going to up the stock of a stock that's already up. And you got this guy in your house right now. Don't waste it. Don't mess this up. So, so much happened in this segment. This segment was huge. And I think this segment like really shaped months of storylines to come. I think eventually we're going to get a Kenny Omega, Jay White match, right? I, I, I think that they kind of uh, foreshadowed that. I'm interested as to where and when this match would be. Um, I mean, listen, October's a little while away. So there's some stuff to, to go in between now and then, but it's not that far away. Yeah. Right. Like, it's basically August, right? So four weeks until September, four more weeks until October. You know what I mean? So again, interesting stuff. There's a lot that can be done and time is kind of running out for my plan. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, whoo. Anything else on this segment? No, just, uh, you know, we talked a lot about Jay, Jay White before we started recording. I'm, I'm on, I'm, I'm in your boat. I didn't know anything about him. I saw him wrestle one time in a ring of honor. Uh, uh, I already forgot the name of the tournament. The one at Leo, Leo rush had won the tournament, but it's kind of like their upcoming talent, whatever. Yep. Um, but that's the only time I saw him wrestle. I saw someone tweet about him one time, how, how good he was. I was like, well, has a pretty normal name at the time. Kind of had a pretty normal look. I didn't even know the dude had an accent. Um, mm, right. so he started talking. <laughs> so I knew nothing about him. And, and as you said, I was already so like, dude, he is a top guy. Even Don Callis was said, you know, bull clubs with the exception of yourself, a bunch of mid carters, you know, mm -hmm. so even, even Don put him over too. He wasn't, you know, he didn't downplay him in any way whatsoever uh and i think chris bay's affiliation with them could be a good thing so uh i i thought it was good man just that whole segment really really had me hooked uh cannot wait for this match next week i really can't yeah um, and so then again, this segment was cash money. Once we leave the ring, we go backstage and mean Gia is interviewing none other than Josh Alexander. And she's, uh, you know, pretty much talking to him saying, you know, Hey, what's next for you after your Iron Man match? And he's like, Hey, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm, 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 I said, I was going to put the X division back on the map and Impact deserves a champion they can be proud of when, lo and behold, the door opens behind him <laughs> and bumps him a little rudely, a little disrespectfully, and who comes from behind that door but Kenny Omega and Don Callis. And then we have a little face-off. We got Josh Alexander holding the X Division title, and we got Kenny Omega holding the Impact title. And they did it very quickly, very quickly. They just kind of looked each other up and down. Kenny said, you know, a thing or two. And uh, Don Callis is like, all right, come on, come on, let's go. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, it's happening. It's happening yeah. He said, you're the X Division guy, right? <laughs> uh, lightweight division, cruiserweight, some shit like that. Oh, yeah. my God, dude. Yeah, I was like, it's happening. Oh, my God. Oh, whoo. I was so fast then, forwarding through this at first because now I just, well, now I just mute all the backstage segments because uh, of the music. And, you know, instead of complaining, I just don't listen to it. But then when I saw Kenny Omega come out, I hit, I hit unmute. Um, yeah. I was like, yo, that, that it was good. That was good. It's, it's quick, happening. effective, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, all right. Um, then next we see the Good Brothers cutting a promo on Jay White and Chris Bay, and they challenged them to a tag team match. Next, we're going to Impact. All right. Uh, next, we go back to the ring for Ace Austin and Madman Fulton against Finn Juice, David Finley, and Juice Robinson. Um, Juice hits Ace with a delayed vertical suplex, followed by a leg drop from Finley. Ace and Fulton turn the tide as they cut off the ring and wear Finley down. Ace connects with his signature springboard kick, but Finley kicks out at two 
Finley takes out Fulton with a slingshot crossbody to the floor in the ring. Juice pummels Ace with a series of closed fists. Juice stacks up Fulton to score the pin and the win. After the match, Ace and Fulton assault Finn Juice from behind, but the tables are quickly turned. Finn Juice are about to hit the Doomsday device when Rohit Raju and Shira join the fray. Rohit and Shira assist Ace and Fulton as they stand tall over Finn Juice. What'd you think of this? I didn't care. This was the segment from earlier. <laughs> I was I got him confused, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. just I, I knew there was no way they were gonna win. It's probably setting up to some Finn Juice teaming up with someone against these guys. Uh, they're they're not gonna win. It's 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 like when they would do eight man tag team matches versus like Reno Scum and Triple XL. I was just like, okay, yeah. we're supposed to believe that uh, you know, this team is gonna win. As as I said earlier, I thought Shira and Fulton were basically ruined at Slammiversary, and and this just this just further made Fulton look like. I mean, what they're doing with Morrissey right now, they they could have done with Fulton, and You're right, hundred percent kind of right, and not to. Uh, and it, it's clear it's clear they're never going to get to that point with them. So uh, I'm yeah. not a Finn Juice fan. I am, you know, Ace is cool. I just uh, I didn't really care about the match. I, I just thought it was a cheap way at the end of of finding a way to do an eight man tag team match that Finn Juice and whoever are going to win. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, I feel you on that. I looked at this a little bit differently. I like the energy that Finn Juice comes out with, man. Like, Finn Juice looks like they are happy and excited to be there when they come out to the stage. And that's something that you rarely see from anybody who comes out on that stage. They look like they <laughs> – I remember years ago, man. I remember – oh, gosh, this had to be, like, 2007, 2008, something like that. Um, one of the first times I took my nephews to wrestling in, uh, in, in Bridgeport, Connecticut – and it was a SmackDown taping. And I remember The Miz and John Morrison were tag teaming for the first time. <laughs> and oh. um, um, they were, they were I think they were the tag team champions. But I just remember, like, when the music hit and, you know, Miz came out. And these guys were the biggest cornballs ever. They still are. But just I remember Miz just seemed so excited to be there. Like, he was doing his corny thing with his big shorts and his – you know, raise his hand and he would do like this or something. I was like, gosh, you're the biggest nerd ever. But he looked happy and excited to be there. And I thought it was just, it was cool. Like he brought the energy, made me enjoy watching him. And that's what I get from Finn Juice when they come out. Like they look like they are excited to be there. They're having a good time. They're enjoying being a part of the show, entertaining the people at home. So I'm here for that. Um, Rohit and Shira and Ace and Fulton, you know, I feel like I look at the, those three teams and I'm like, man, you know, we can get how many match combinations can we get out of these three teams? And you can build up a tag team to challenge for the tag championships. What is that? Is that a thing anymore? Mm. You see a team win some matches so that you think you're a credible challenger for the tag team championships. I, I know it's wild. It's a wild, <laughs> far out idea. I know, I know, I know. But listen, it worked for Goldberg, okay? Right. So, you know, like, <laughs> why not let us see somebody beating somebody before they get a tag team title shot? Call me crazy. So, yeah, I, I'm I, I'm, I'm always hopeful for the, uh, you see like those memes on social media when they be like, oh, <laughs> they're like, and Terrence thought there would be, uh, the, he, he thought there would be, uh, Good tag, a good tag team division going forward, and then a pause, and the song goes. But I'm hopeful, hopeful, hopeful for today. And then they put like the the, the words was like, "Impact did not do a good tag team division." No, I'm not seen that. <laughs> 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 All right, we got backstage, and we got Rich Swan and Willie Mack. They reveal that Violent by Design are blaming them for their loss in the Fatal Four Way. Uh, for the Impact Tag Team titles at Slammiversary. Swan and Matt challenge Violent by Design to meet them in the middle of the ring next week. But Eric Young has other plans. The lights flicker off and they come back on and Eric Young is standing in the back of the room. The lights flicker some more and the rest of Violent by Design comes out and they jump Rich Swan and Willie Mack, treat them to a nice beatdown. And so I'm guessing that means there'll be a match next week. Usually, right? That's how it goes. Yeah, yeah. Because I think they, they, I thought they challenged them. Yeah. So, um, I want to say I thought Rich Swan. 
I really liked just the tempo and the pace and the and the tone that he cut this promo in. Mm-hmm. I kind of would like to see more of that from him. He, he he's slowly become my favorite wrestler, I think, in the company. So uh, I mean, him and Moose. So mm-hmm. um, I, I'm looking forward to him. I'm looking forward to the match. I've never been much of a violent by design guy. I mean, I, I like Diener. I think Joe Doring just stands out like a green hat with, with an orange bill. Uh, <laughs> You know, just I don't understand the fashion. Yeah. Um, not to say he's not good. I think you know it's pretty good for a guy's size. Uh, I, I'm I'm willing to bet they never get a rematch for the tag team titles because they were placeholder champions. Like right, they need to get those titles off Finn Juice, and they have yeah, to get rid of that a, damn trophy. That's all it was. So they're not even gonna bullshit us with a with a rematch, which. That's why you know I'm kind of glad AW doesn't even do the rematch clause because. That way you're not picking and choosing, and we, like we're idiots as fans watching. We're not picking and choosing when someone gets a rematch and when they don't. Like Fire Flava got a rematch for the titles tonight, but, uh, but Violent by Design doesn't. You know, right? I just and by the way, Impact blows off their rematches. They have a pattern of blowing them off like so the next night quickly, right? The night after the pay per view, and it's like there's no build to this, no anticipation. And we know you're not going to take the titles back off this person in one match. So like, <laughs> right. So it's just, it's just dead. Like, why would you do that? You so, spent all this time building the actual match for the pay-per-view and, and then the rematch is just the next night with nothing whatsoever. Exactly. Um, and I'm not saying what I, I will say, I'll give them props for, you know, WWE is notorious for this of having rematches at the pay-per-view. It's, it's these guys wrestle the pay-per-view and the next one, they're still wrestling. Like, Impact doesn't do that. They don't have rematches uh, for titles. Like I remember Hard to Kill. People were like, I bet it's going to be Eddie. Not had a Hard to Kill, but uh, I don't remember what pay-per-view it was. Eddie was still a champion. Like, oh, I bet the, you know, the, the main event is going to be Eric Young versus Eddie Edwards. Eddie trying to get his title back. And I'm just like, when have they ever main evented a show with a rematch? You know, like right. really throughout the pay-per-views, they don't do rematches, you know, spe- for the Speaking belt. Speaking of main rematch. eventing a show with a rematch, backstage, <laughs> we see Moose going up to knock on Scott Demore's door to ask for a rematch against Chris Saban. He's like, I was killing Chris Saban, and he just, you know, he snuck out a win on me. And then Saban walks up to him. He's like, hey, Moose, you looking for me? You want to fight? We'll fight right now. So they're getting each other's face. And Scott Demore is like, Okay, next week you'll have your rematch, and it'll be the main event of the show. Uh, For once, so, Scott Demore wasn't annoying as shit. You know, <laughs> hey, you, you want to fight Moose? Okay, we'll have a match. Oh, oh, funny. I'm funny. I'm popping myself. You know, like he wasn't annoying for once. He was just an authority figure for once. For once, instead of trying to be funny, trying to he always leaves the segments like he's the star. Right. That's what annoys the right. shit out of me. Like he's he's right. Just... Like authority figures aren't supposed to be like really strong. They're not really supposed to be like in charge. You're just kind of there, right? You're supposed to be there. <laughs> right. Wrestling authority figures, at least, yeah. Yeah. He's but, like, oh yeah. No, right. <laughs> yeah. But, not like in real life. <laughs> yeah. But just oh, he just leaves every segment making the wrestler look silly. Uh, and and here he was just doing his job. Like it wasn't right. Arr! You know, so it's my Scott D. Moore voice. It's got the more impression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yo, when I, by the way, when I saw the Chris Saban win over Moose at the anniversary, I liked it. I liked it because I said, this was a good match. I wouldn't mind seeing a couple more of these. And sure enough, we're going to get a couple more of these. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve Macklin has demanded more competition. And next Thursday on BTI, he gets it in the form of Trey Miguel. Oh. Uh, okay. So, um, it feels like a waste putting this on BTI. Absolutely. Um, I also don't like the idea of beating Trey Miguel. And I feel like Steve Macklin, his only usefulness is as like a crazy heel. So, you have to build him up to challenge your babyface champion but they don't have a baby face champion right now. So that means Steve Macklin has to win for a while. Um, but to me, he is boring and bland as freaking mayonnaise. Really? I like him. I, I like him. Oh my God. I, I just, I don't see it. What is it? What is it? Like, first of all, he looks like, um, 
how do I say this nicely? Like he, he doesn't look like he's in sh great shape, which is crazy because he has like defined pecs. And you can see a little bit of stomach muscle, but I can also tell he would be in better shape if he was going to be on Monday Night Raw next week. I, I makes sense. I get it. I, I don't know. I, I think I, I just, I mean, he's a, he's a veteran. So I, I connect with him in that reason. I mean, for that reason, you know, I've said before, I don't, I never seem to like wrestlers from California. I never like to see, you know, Puerto Rican wrestlers. Like you would think that those two uh, demographics I would care for. And I, I never seem to Is he but, Puerto Rican. Uh, no, no. But I mean, in general, like I've uh, like, I, I told you, like, I like Evil East, but outside of that, like, I, just... <laughs> was that? So you just figured you just take some shots at Puerto Ricans? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, me being Puerto Rican, I mean, so, uh, you know, I told you before, like I like Evil East, but I never liked LAX that much. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I thought like they're okay. I was just never yeah. like, oh, let me, you know, uh, but just just throughout the years, like people who fit my own demographic, you know, even the right. Californians, I never the Young Bucks, SCU, yeah. like these dudes, you know, I just don't care. But veteran wrestlers, I'm always, I, you know, I can always relate <laughs> yeah. to them. I like them. So I, I like Macklin. I actually just ordered his shirt. I got oh, wow. that and the um, Brian Myers. Sure, and then I I got it, dude. I in the same uh, order. I got the a Jade Cargill shirt because I think she's a freaking superstar, dude. Nice. Um, that that's just a blue chipper in my opinion. So I was like, dude, I want I want one of her shirts. But but yeah, impact wise, I got a Macklin and Brian Myers one. But I don't know. I I personally like them, but you know, it's whatever. Yeah, I mean, listen. So I I understand um, knowing something about a wrestler and like rooting for them, right? Like on a human level. I totally get that. And I, I totally agree with that. It's similar to what I was saying about uh what's her name about Chelsea Green, right? Yeah. Um true. but I mean, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Like I said, he, he's he's pretty bland. I, I just I don't see the character. You know what I mean? Like I don't see the character. So <clears throat> hopefully he'll find it at some point. But for now it's just not connecting with me. What's his um, name? Uh Des Desmond uh, Xavier Dez, he, he he's a veteran too, but that they never uh, that's never played into at all. <laughs> uh, you know, that's an interesting conversation um, that we could have at another time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, about you know who does and doesn't get to be representative of America on you know according to certain platforms. Yeah. <laughs> all right, <clears throat> so let's see. All right, so <clears throat> our main event of the show was uh, the Knockouts Tag Team Championship. We just really talked about this. Uh, Rosemary and, and Havoc versus Fire and Flava. Um, good match. This was actually a, a pretty good match. Match ended with uh, Kiera inadvertently super kicked her own partner, leading to a match-winning spear by rosemary and decay celebrates as they go off the air what'd you think about this so knowing what we know about kiera i, I knew who i knew that they were going to lose um mm -hmm. i remember as a kid watching wrestling in the 80s and it's like uh you know tito santana accidentally hits rick martell one time and now they're going to break up the strike force you know right you know, like Back then, there was like so such little storytelling when they were breaking up tag teams. Uh, <laughs> so with this one, you know, since they ha didn't have a chance to tell a story, it's like, okay, well, that's how they're doing it. They're gonna, right? They're they're gonna force the shit out of it, even though they've been the tightest unit um, mm -hmm. in the knockouts that there is. So, um, I'm disappointed that she's she's on her way out. You know, I, I thought she was really the best homegrown star they had. As far as really building her up, I thought she deserved a good knockouts title, if not a run, at least a program. Um, she's probably the hottest knockout in my opinion, too. So, uh, so, so now she's <laughs> now she's gone. But uh, I, I'm I'm enjoying Havoc as a part of Decay. That adds, you know, we're starting to get like a stableish type of feel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes throughout the show, I was I earlier in the show when I I was watching uh, Cardona with. Caleb with a K and Sam Beal and Tennille. I was kind of like, oh, cool. They're, they're going to be like a little stable. Then they broke up in the middle of the promo. Um, <laughs> but I kind of like this new look. For, 
I, I like this uh, new look for Decay. And um, the match was, I, I enjoyed it, dude. I, I really liked Fire and Flavor's like their outfits and like Kiera's hair. Like she's always, she always finds something new to do, man. It was like half mm-hmm. red, half blue. It's, it's just like, it looked like they were going all in on Fire and Flavor. <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't think watching this match that, you know, they're, they're going to move on from it. But, um, it was it was a good knockouts main event, and it, it, you know it looks like Rosemary and Havoc are probably going to have a pretty strong title run. It's good to see Rosemary with some gold again. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't seem to put the belts on the homegrown guy, or the guys, the people who've been around for a long time. It's like yeah. this is Rosemary's been around forever. This is her second time with a title. Kiera had the tag team titles here at the end. Um, Eddie never really has a title. You know he had a couple short runs. Uh, Moose has never had one. You know, just these guys that, uh, you know, they keep around. They, they'd rather put the Damn. titles on, you know, people from other companies. But it was a good knockouts match. I worry about the division and the tag division and what the hell is next for them. But, mm-hmm. you know, I guess the story here is the Fire and Flava breakup, you know. Yeah, which they didn't elaborate on during the show. But, again, like I said, we saw the news earlier in the day. Speaking of that news, I got a little, a little, a little rant about this guy. <clears throat> of course, when the what do you think that headline read when we all saw it about Kira? Mm-hmm. That I don't know that her contract ran out and she didn't stay. That'd be nice if it said that, but you know, it was much more likely that it said Kira Hogan done with Impact Wrestling. Oh, right, right, right yeah, and. That's the way it's always framed when somebody's contract runs out or somebody gets released or whatever from Impact Wrestling. It's always so-and-so done with Impact Wrestling. (laughs) With the implication being that this person got tired of working at Impact, they no longer want to work for Impact anymore, and so they're moving on to to, to better the whatever, right? (laughs) You're right, yep. Um, You never see that when it's WWE. It's always... So and so's contract wasn't renewed, or so and so was released, or you know whatever, whatever. You never see like Brian Myers done with WWE. You <laughs> never see that, dog. You never see that. And like, yeah. I, I, it could be the, the most you know low minuscule person, and it's always so and so done with Impact Wrestling. And I just I hate it, dog. I hate it like this is not me being the defender of impact i'm just like patently against unfairness especially by institutions you know like the media that are supposed to be like fair and biased you're sharing news you're supposed to be fair and unbiased right right um and again it just it creates this perception that people just don't want to work at impact and i guarantee you in every single one of those situations if Impact was willing to pay what that person wanted to make, they wouldn't be done with Impact Wrestling, okay? They're done with Impact Wrestling because, like all of us, when our contracts come up, we ask for a raise. And when uh, and, and, and when that person asks for a raise and when Impact's like, eh, we don't think you're worth that, you know, they say negotiations are business and not personal. It's always personal. It's always personal when a company tells you that you're not worth what you think you are worth. Yeah. And you know what I mean? So people, they take that however they take it and they make an emotional decision and they decide to move on with their career. Um, I think a lot of stuff you said about Kara Hogan is true. If she doesn't change something, I see her struggling uh, outside really? of impact. Really? Because um, I think... that her character still came in. I think she was really struggling to find out who, not to find out, not necessarily to find out who she was, but to be comfortable being outwardly like the person that she is now. Yeah, it took her a Um, while. Yeah. Go back and watch, watch her on Impact, like, you know, through all the stuff she was doing, you know, being this person's buddy and being that person's buddy. She never was able to project the personality that would really allow them to give her her own program. Yeah. Tasha Steele's come in. And again, I said this a couple of weeks ago and it offended some butthurt listener, but 
<laughs> it can be hard being the only black person in the room. And it's not about like just being the black person in the room, but like um if your gimmick is sassy black girl and nobody gets it, then you can start to doubt yourself. You know what I mean? There are some people who have so much self-confidence who are just like, yo, I'm going to do this. I know it's going to work. It's going to be great. And if you don't get it, that's your problem. Yeah. But a lot of people, if you're telling somebody you have this great idea and then you're telling them your idea, they're like, eh, I, just, I don't get it, right? Like most people are like, hey, what's wrong with my idea? You know what I mean? Like that's like, that type of stuff kills your confidence. So when Tasha Stills came in and she's like, yo, this is who I am, you know, like whatever, whatever, Kara Hogan's like, yes, that's who I am too. You know yeah. what I mean? And then again, it allowed her to come out of her shell to be more of the person, the character that she has evolved into. And I don't think that happens without Tasha Steeles. And so she has evolved now. She's much more out of her shell. She's a much better character and performer today than she was before Tasha Steeles got there. Yeah. But I think being, you know, a beautiful black woman with long blue hair is going to cause comparisons to Sasha Banks that are completely unfair and way too heavy for Kiara Hogan to handle at this point. Um, and yeah, so I think that like, if you're NXT, why would you take a junior Sasha Banks? You know what I mean? She'd have to come in. She'd have to like change her character. If yeah, you're NXT. completely. Yeah. If you're AEW, why would you take a knockoff Sasha Banks? You know what I mean? And I don't think, by the way, let me just be clear. I don't think Kiara Hogan is a knockoff Sasha Banks, but that's what people are going to say. Yeah. Because people out here, they only see things through the lens that WWE has told them to see it. So they see, you know, a smallish black woman with long, you know, blue or purple or pink or red hair. They're going to be like, oh, she's trying to be like Sasha Banks. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, I think, you know, she's going to have to go through another phase of development before, you know, she's really, um, she really has a, a character that people are going to embrace. I hope she does. You know what I mean? Because I think she's very talented and I, I wish everybody, you know, financial success, you know, go make the money that you can make. But I don't know, man, I think she's going to, I think she's going to struggle a little bit um, to find to find her own voice, um, to find her own, to, to be able to sell her own personality. Um, and, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. You know, maybe with Tasha Steeles being off the indies, kind of, you know, maybe she'll fill that void of picking up the dates that Tasha Steeles can't do anymore. I don't know. You know what I mean? Maybe that's the thing. But, you know, we'll see. That's a fine motherfucker too, Sa Sasha Banks, man. Um, <laughs> but, uh, to go to your uh, to your point on Kiara, Tasha Steeles was the same in, in NWA, man. Like she she mm. had no mm. personality whatsoever. Like she she had she had that look, but then mm. she tagged in with, tagged with like Allison K and uh, Marty Bell, mm. um, and she was a baby face, and it was just like, who the fuck is this? You know, that's the first time I was ever, ever seen her. That I was from you know wasn't really familiar with her, and um she she came to life too so i think the two of them together really yeah. really brought out the best in each other but but also the character that tasha steals is can't be a baby face that's not a baby face character yeah not at all so. no and, and and yeah but kira it took her a long time because at first it's like yo, yo she is the worst actress i've ever heard in my life you know <laughs> yeah. um but she she i mean she came out of her shell so much and it was just like shit you know, I, th I thought she was gonna be someone that they really try to keep around. And I think yeah. what you said is probably accurate that the because when she released the the statement, it was via her only fans. She put my time and impact has come to an end. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna see what else is out there for me. It's scary but exciting. And she had like the sad face emo like the that eyes full of tears emoji. Yeah. So I'm gonna assume without knowing, like what you said that. She mostly said, okay, I, I know my worth now. This is what I would like to be compensated with. They didn't agree. So she felt the only, you know, the only option was to see what else is out there. Right. You know, um, there it is. 
And and I think those are always hard conversations. Like, I don't give a damn. I don't care if you're a garbage man. You know what I mean? If you, you know, muster up all your uh, courage to, you know, say, hey, I want to, you know, I, I want to. I want to be the driver as opposed to the guy that collects the, the the cans and dumps them in the back. And they tell you, we don't think you're qualified to be a driver. You know, like there's a great chance you're going to be like, let me see what other garbage companies are around. You, are. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and that's not to not be in a garbage man, by the way. Some of some, I got some good friends who, who work in, um, in, in that position, you know what I mean? Good people. It's a great, honest living. So I would never, ever, ever try to downplay somebody that, you know, works hard with their hands for a living. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying that anybody, no matter what your job is, like like I said, all of us, when our year is up or when our contract is up, we all ask for a raise. We all do it. And if you don't, then you're a fool. And um, yeah, and 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 when your employer tells you, we don't think you're, you know, we 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 can't pay you that, you know, or, or you know, and they, and they try to give you a list of reasons why they why they can't pay you that. What you're hearing is. Oh, you think I don't deserve it? You know what I mean, right? And um, and yeah, that's that's what it is, right? Like you know, again, they say it's it's not personal. They say it's just business, but it's always personal. It's right. always personal when somebody tries to tell you you're not worth what you think you're worth. And so, that's that that's how you see. I, I would be willing to bet. Pff, what percentage of people do you think leave their job based off a conversation like that? A, a high percentage right at least 70 80 percent yeah you know what i mean at, at least 70 80 percent because even if you make a lateral move after that at least you start a new job feeling appreciated you know what i mean yeah and 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 when you no longer feel appreciated it's hard to come and do your job it is it is there's only so much now some jobs you can't negotiate you know right um like i make a, a fixed hourly wage but i'm happy right. with it so i have i had you know i can't change it if i wanted to but i'm happy with it so it's not that big of a deal my right. my fiance she she's a nurse so she makes a certain hourly wage but she mm -hmm. can uh she can negotiate that so i mean just half a year ago it got to the point where she's like look i've i've done everything you've asked of me um she does home health. She she's you know, she's like I'm working with a family that no one else wanted to take. Yeah, because the you know it's in Ferguson, <laughs> Ferguson, mm -hmm. Missouri, with you know it's a little bit of drama in that household. Sure. So you know I said ask for more money. Like no one else is taking that job. You know there's only so long that you're gonna say okay, cool. I like what you pay me, but I I can only do what I do for so long for that pay. And that once I've shown you I can master all that and I can handle more or I, I should be appreciated for what I did. Um, I think I should be paid more, you know? And I, I told my old lady, if, if they don't pay you more, like let's look for somewhere else, somewhere else. I will appreciate that effort, you know? So, uh, you know, people like to say, Oh, well, it's not about money. It doesn't come to mind. Like, yes, it is. There's a few wrestlers who really value creative control. But at the end of the day, you want to be paid your worth. And that's what it is. It doesn't mean you have to be paid the most money in the world. You know, some people may not go to WWE because I will, when they say money isn't a motivating factor, they just mean you don't have to make me rich, but everyone wants to be paid right. their worth. You exactly. Know? Exactly. Exactly. So. so yeah, overall, man, this was a, a, a great show coming out of Slammiversary. Um, <clears throat> they certainly set up a good amount of, of, of storylines, you know, what I'm starting to notice with Impact is that Slammiversary is kind of, you know, Bound for Glory, they say, is like the biggest show of the year. And you would think that's like their reset, but it feels more like Slammiversary is becoming like the reset time, you know, when they're like resetting storylines. And, you know, like I said, yeah. I think there's one major storyline that's still. And by the way, let's do that before we before we close out here. Let's do World Title Watch. All right. World Title Watch is where we take a look at the comings and goings of the Impact Wrestling World Champion and <clears throat> the World Championship, and we look at where we think the title is going to end up and who we think might be the person to possibly bring it back home. So I'm going to start here, okay, because as I alluded to earlier, when we got the segment backstage with Josh Alexander and 
uh, and and Kenny Omega, I popped big. I popped big because if you guys listen to the show, I've been saying this for the longest time. Damn it, I've been saying this for the longest time. There is, and I mean this with no disrespect to Moose, although, sidebar, Moose, I've found, has a weird problem with Black podcasters that I just, I can't understand for the life of me. I can't understand for life. Like, like it's, it's so weird. It's so weird. So this dude, Moose, right? I just, I gotta, I gotta say this. This dude, Moose, he... He takes it upon himself to, um, lots of wrestlers do this. If they see something about them that they think is, you know, not factual or, you know, whatever, you know, sometimes they'll, you know, clap back or whatever at the, you know, the person who, 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 you know, it feels like misrepresented or whatever. But I just feel like with this dude, Moose, man, it seems to always be with like a black podcaster. And I'm like, bro, like what is going on here? So a few weeks ago, I talked about the, uh, the BRP 50, right? The, uh, the, the, the black wrestling podcast, they do, uh, uh, they rank the 50 best black wrestlers, um, every year, you know, throughout the entire industry. And last year, I believe they had Moose at number 38 and he, uh, you know, DM them and told him to take take him off the list. And they was like, what? And then, I don't know if anybody wants to look up and see what he was on the PWI uh, 500 that year, but he was way the hell down and he ain't bad at eye. You didn't see him not once, you know, slandering PWI. You know what I mean? And right. that's got to be just like so insulting, bro. So insulting. Like, again, it's just like, if you see these brothers out here, you know, doing something that people can get behind, going out of their way to support you, by the way, no matter where you're ranked on the list, adding you to the list is supporting you, right? Yeah. That's publicity for you. And you're going to tell them you don't want to be associated with the list? What? Why? Because you wasn't number one? You know what I mean? Like, come on, like, give me a break, bro. Give me a break. And then, so what happened most recently um, the Public Enemies podcast uh, tweeted out, I believe it was, pub, pub, apologize if I'm, if I'm misquoting here, but I believe it was the Public Enemies podcast. They tweeted out uh, a, a graphic, something like, um, you know, it's, it's something to the effect of, you know, Bobby Lashley and Kobe Kingston are going to main event for the world title. They're like, you know, this is like only the third or fourth time this has happened. You know, this is history, you know, two black men, you know, fighting for the world title in the main event. And it listed, I think it was, it was two or three other matches. And, you know, um, there was a Ring of Honor match between, I think it was Kenny Ome uh, Kenny King and Jay Lethal. And I think, you know, Kenny King was like, hey, y'all forgot about me. And they're like, oh, my bad. And they like redid the graphic and added Kenny King to it, right? And then Moose respond just like, oh, do your research before this horrible take. And it was, it was like, yo, it's like, bro, like, why are you out here trying to, like, shit on these dudes? Like, if, if somebody missed your match you have with Rich Swan, like, honestly, you need to blame the company you work for. That that's not more of a big deal in people's minds. You know what I mean? Like, so anyway, I'm just saying it's so weird to me that Moose seems to go out of his way to have a, a a problem with black podcasters and i'm just like bro i it's weird to me it's just it's weird it's weird you know what i mean so oh that was a sidebar but <laughs> i got on that i got off that on that tangent because moose was the person who i thought a couple of months ago would be the person to bring the title back from kenny omega like i said moose had been on like a two-year pay-per-view winning streak and it was like, yo, Moose, you know, all this equity has to be built up for something. They brought back EC3 last year and Moose beat EC3. I was like, oh man, no, this is this is going somewhere. And then, you know, lo and behold, look where we are now. Moose has lost, God, I think three of his last four pay-per-view matches or yeah. something. Like, you know what I mean? Like, woof, they've cooled him off like a mug. And so once Josh Alexander became the... Uh, X Division champion. I, me, nobody else. I said, I, I, listen, I just, I thought it would be a really cool idea 
if they tried to duplicate what Austin Aries did, and I think that was like 2011, 2012, where he won the X Division title and was just beating people, you know, week after week after week after week. And before you know it, you looked up and you had him and you had Bobby Roode, you know, both with these really long dominant title reigns. And there was nobody else for Austin Aries to, to go after. And so, you know, he gave up the exhibition title to challenge for the world title. And I thought that was great. Uh, you know, un- unfortunately, they saw, they also thought it was a great time to do aces and eights. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I thought that was a great blueprint for what they could do with Josh Alexander. You know, in what feels like a compressed amount of time, he needs to just be beating people, putting great moments, great matches in the bank each and every week. And again, he needs to be main eventing impact. He needs to be Mm -hmm. the one closing the show, opening the show. They need to treat him like a superstar because impact has a chance to do something they have not done in a long, long time. And that is make a star in Josh Alexander. He needs to keep winning, beating everybody in his path until it's him and Kenny Omega. And he needs to be the one to take the title off Kenny Omega. If you do that, then you are off to the races with the man who took the title off Kenny Omega as your hood ornament. And at this point, it feels like a no brainer. And when I saw them, you know, meet, <laughs> yep, that was that they, they, they teased it. And so I'm feeling like I like the chances that this could, could happen, but in order for it to work like it's supposed to, you got to keep building Josh Alexander. He's got to keep having great matches after great matches and you got to keep promoting this guy. So that's where I am with world title watch. Where are you? So I know that Kenny Omega's next challenger is someone we haven't talked about. That's that's what I know. I don't know who it is. I'm sure it's an Impact Plus type of match. I don't think it's the Bound for Glory challenge or anything like that. I looked at the Impact roster here real quick. I think I know who it is, by the way. Go ahead. Right. My, my assumption is that it's Cardona. Uh I, I don't know for sure, and I'm sure, and I, I don't want to know. I sh- I'm sure someone's going to say something in the comments, but uh, that's why I assume it is because I, I know it's someone that told me that they they didn't like who it was, and I'm like, well, I don't know who else could you know kind of fit that description <laughs> besides him. Okay. So uh, unless it's like they think we want to see Tommy Dreamer or Rhino wrestle for the title, that's the only thing I could think oh, could possibly we worse. Oh. So I I don't <laughs> hopefully that's not what it is but um I don't know that's that's the only match I could think of that they would do Cardona cuz cuz I was like who wrestled early in the slam anniversary card that that's how I I kind of looked at it like it has to be hmm. someone just nowhere near that main event slot um and the Cardona's now won two matches in a row even though he didn't get the pin in either of them but <laughs> you know that's just uh the assumption I have so can I tell you who I think it is? Huh? Chris Saban. Okay. That that was that was my probably second guess. Yeah. It's Chris Saban. Chris Saban <clears throat> Moose is the springboard. You know? Moose is the springboard. Like like I said, all that equity I just talked about that Moose had built up, where you know, we hope there'll be for a world to legitimize him as a world champion in the hood ornament of the company. Nope. It was to be a nice, healthy springboard to be fed to Kenny Omega. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's what it is, man. I, I, I thought of when Tennille came out. I mean, uh, Jordan, w- Jesus Christ. Taylor Wilde came out and kind of randomly attacked Tennille. It made me think of Chris Saban attacking Moose, which this was a little more recent. <laughs> there, there was a little bit of a history between... Taylor Wilde and, and, you know, Tennille as far mm-hmm. as like, oh, be my partner and all, all that kind of crap. But it wasn't like that hot of a feud where yeah. Taylor Wilde had to come down. And By the way, they did in the backstage segment, which I'm sure you probably have muted, 
<laughs> Tanil, uh, she teased, she teased that she's the one who attacked Taylor Wilde. No, I saw that segment. Oh, you saw that? I okay, thought it was yeah, yeah. funny. I thought, yeah. She was like, she's like Taylor Wilde. She's probably like she, accusing me of being the reason she hasn't been here for so long. And so I was like, who said that? She's yeah, like, it's like I don't think she. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was funny, I, but I was very disappointed. I thought they were gonna, her and Brian Myers. That would have been my team. I'm like, okay, cool, yeah. and they're like, oh, we're not teaming up. I'm like, shit. Um, so real quick, out there in uh, Impact Lounge Land, if anybody out there likes action figures, I have some uh, some WWE action figure goodies that I'm looking to get rid of. If you guys are interested, drop. Just drop a comment down below. Let let uh let me know if you're interested. And if enough people are interested, then you know I'll do some sort of random drawing. You guys can you know hit me up on Twitter, and uh, I'll do some sort of random drawing. I got these things I want to give away. If nobody claims them, I'm just going to give them to my kids. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, man. I think that's all I got this week. You got anything else? Nope. That it. That will do it for me. All right, man. So thank you guys so much for listening. That's our show for this week. Um, if you like what you're hearing, please, 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 please make sure to like this video, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. So, you know, anytime we drop some new content on the page, BQ, tell the people where they can find you on social. So BQ speaks at Twitter. And finally, after a year and a half, the impact lounge on Twitter has been un un unlocked. Uh, I got lo locked out of that account somehow. I only have like three passwords I use and none of them worked. And <laughs> the way that I had it tied into the BQ speaks and didn't have an actual email address associated with it. What a nightmare. Uh, but I finally got unlocked. So you can check out the impact lounge on Twitter where that's going to be more tweeting out the actual content um, and not, not like my own where I do opinions and things like that. So BQ speaks on Twitter, but then look up the impact lounge on Twitter as well. Very nice, very nice. You can follow me on Twitter at TW Talking About. You can follow my podcast page at Talking About Pod. Tweet me. I tweet back. I live tweet impact. Any thoughts or, or wrestling you got going throughout the week, tweet me. Like I said, I tweet back. I can't wait to engage you guys in conversation. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube or listen to it in the podcast, make sure you share it. Drop it in somebody's Facebook page, somebody who you know is a wrestling fan. Go ahead, drop it in there. Say, hey, these guys are so smart. Or, hey, listen to these two idiots talking about impact wrestling. Uh, <laughs> tell a friend to tell a friend. Bring more people into the conversation. I'm TW. I'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.